Thank you, David. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, my name is Catherine Grimes, and I am thrilled to be moderating this next panel, which is going to be providing, co-moderating that is, with Professor Pastorino on um, lung cancer screening implementation updates. You'll be hearing from 10 countries from uh, the IELCAP Research Network, and I'd like to go ahead and invite the 10 panelists, please. We're going to go ahead. There are 10 chairs up here. If everyone can please join me on the stage. I think all of our presenters are here in person. I haven't yet seen Dr. Seho. Seho, yes, perfect. And McWilliams, virtual. Okay, we do have one virtual participant. Thank you. Please, Dr. Pastorino, join me. <laughs> nice to meet you too. I'm just meeting my co-moderator for the first time. Um, we, we should be going in the order of the agenda and really Dr. Pastorino and I's um, main role other than Dr. Pastorino's presentation from Italy is to just keep things moving and on time um, and make sure the slides are up and all that good stuff. And if there's time at the end, we will try to take some questions. Um, so while the folks are getting settled, I will go ahead and um, I think Dr. Pastorino, you're going to be our first presenter with an update from Italy. So I turn the podium to you. Thank you. Six minutes. I think it's the shortest presentation probably of my life. That's great. So uh, I imagine uh, I imagine you have already discussed this. So to me, this is a really the great uh, breakthrough and uh, and a great uh, gift for all of us. Uh, uh, and uh, the fact that England is uh, is leading uh, Europe uh, in this respect is. Uh, is a fantastic. It's not a surprise. I mean, um, uh, the uh, our present uh, plan for uh, for uh, for implementation of screening uh, is derived from a number of studies that we've conducted uh, over twenty years, changing uh, the design scores, the type of uh, scanners, going down with uh, with those to zero point four millisievert now. With the new machine, but uh, essentially we have generated a, a number of uh, of uh, data on uh, the the value of volumetric assessment uh, on the the best uh, ultra low dose uh, ultra dose uh, regimen decided through a randomized uh, trial that was recently published on the European Journal of Radiology comparing a random way four different types. Uh, of, uh, of ultra uh, low dose uh, screening. We've continued over this almost 20 years, the surveillance of subsolid, and uh, we are going to publish uh, the data by the end of this year. But in essence, we have more than 1,000 individuals with the subsolid lesion in, in, uh, in uh, surveillance uh, for uh, up to 18 years. And we have 5% progression to invasive all stage one. We have no pulmonary resection for BAC in situ or or typical anomalous hyperplasia, and we have no death from progression from the subsolid lesion. So it is the same. Um, what is new? What is new is uh, is the calcification. The calcification uh, ca automatic CAC has been uh, has jumped in the screening arena in a way that we did not ex expect. So. We use uh, automatic uh, CAC, uh, uh, applying the baseline uh, of the previous trials. And, uh, you know, this is the biomill, the re relatively recent study with uh, with an 128 slides, so modern machine. And you see that you can, you can uh, predict the mortality for all causes at six years, because this is the uh, follow-up to this trial. But uh, when we apply the the same automatic calcification to the mill trial, which is much older, is in 205, with a very old machine, you see, 16 slides is all the prehistory, and it works just as well. So we predict 12 years mortality for all cause within five classes, but what is more interesting, we can predict individuals that don't die, they do not die at 12 years, which is, to me, is something Totally unexpected. I didn't. I didn't think this would be possible. Uh, we also demonstrated that uh, that in a randomized trial that you can combine uh, drug uh, 
with the screening for anti-tobacco drug with screening, this is a, a randomized study is showing that the citizen and a natural drug uh, applied during the screening in a randomized fashion can multiply by five times, uh, six times the number of quits. And uh, this was during the COVID and uh, we had a quit rate on average at the first attempt of 50%. So it's by far more than whatever you can achieve with counseling. And uh, no, what is going on now? This is a this is a slide that I have I have uh, received from the group of Tuscany, the East Pro uh, group. Essentially, uh, is a uh, is summarizing what is the goal of the presently ongoing CCM funded uh, group on the screen of screening. Uh, uh, multi centric you see Florence, Pisa, Milano, Torino, Reggio, Emilia, funded by the Ministry of Health with uh, 800,000 uh, uh, euros uh, to, uh, to recruit uh, more than 1,000 uh, heavy smokers to two annual rounds. This was started in 2022, in October, is going on, is there's health technology assessment a goal, and it wants to complete, provide to the Ministry of Health valuable information on what is the best uh, the best uh, te technique to be implemented this is the the other this is the the the, 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 the network the italian network of cleaning i'm responsible of 18 center uh, all over italy again funded by the ministry of health uh, two years ago and uh, with the uh, with the individual age 55 75 actually 35 pack years or PLCOM 12 above 2.6. Uh, and uh, we implement uh, in, the, in the RISP uh, as a secondary reading, uh, an automatic uh, program that provides uh, LC, LCS uh, assessment of nodules, coronary calcification and uh, emphysema assessment. One of the goals is to test what can be done with the same system of, uh, of automatic intelligence to, through different scanner. So we will use the, the facilities that are available on, the, on a national basis. And as you see, they are very different, but the, the goal here is to see how much how is reliable the assessment of and the quantification of, uh, of uh, emphysema and the calcification through uh, through the territory, the Italian territory. We have uh, registered 60,000 volunteers, uh, almost 8,000 are eligible. Our goal is uh, 8,000. We have already screened 5,300 and we plan to, re to reach the first goal of 7,300 by the end of uh, the summer. We are implementing a web app for recruitment and monitoring. This is part of the European Consortium. And, uh, and this is uh, the group uh, I'm working with. I'm very proud to work with such a, an enormous group of uh, uh, clinicians, radiologists, experimental uh, statisticians, and so on. I mean, uh, Thank you, Professor Pastorino, for setting the tone and keeping us on time. Let's hear next from Switzerland. Yeah. Good afternoon. I have been given the freedom to speak whatever I want to speak about, and that is the reason why I present to you today our findings on measures which should or could be taken to promote easy access. These are the important words, easy access to early lung cancer detection programs. In order to find the answer to that question, how do we offer easy access? we should know what does persons at risk who know about the program discourage to enter a program and discourage to stay in the program. After all, they can't be forced. They can be, they can be uh, convinced sometimes. So um, there are five reasons which uh, discourage people uh, from entering and staying in the program. Fear, fear of bad results. Uh, the time they have to spend, the costs they have to pay, um, the big fuss. The big fuss, that means they have to travel somewhere, they have to enroll in the program, that is sometimes a nuisance. They have to attend uh, several appointments, not just one. They have to wait in a waiting room, they have to wait for the results, they don't understand the results, and the whole thing is not a pleasant thing. And the, five, the fifth reason is the nannyism. 
they, they fear that they will be subject to nannyism. That means they are being told they cannot or should not smoke. They mustn't smoke anymore. They have to attend classes in which they are being told how not to smoke anymore and so on. These five reasons not to enter a program are, of course, not reasonable reasons, but keep in mind you are dealing with smokers. So, uh, in Switzerland, uh, there are some state universities, three, if I, if I, if I record that well, uh, which try to operate a program or a pilot. Heaps of money have been uh, spent and years have passed, many years have passed, and these programs and uh, pilots still are floxinocinally pilificatious. But nevertheless, they are important, although they are tiny, because they show us how it should not be done. Now, how is it be done by the state universities? Um, you see the, the participant uh, attends uh, some appointment at the family doctor for some reason because he has sprained his uh, his ankle or he has a flu. The family doctor uh, persuades him to uh, go to this program and he, the family doctor, has to enroll the patient uh, in the program. Then the radiologist sends the participant uh, the appointment and all the information. The participant goes to the radiologist. The radiologist sends his findings to the pneumologist. The pneumologist calls or writes to the family doctor. The family doctor calls the participant. He should come into his office. And then the, um, uh, then the participant at the end perhaps is even forced to go to a TCO, that is a tobacco cessation officer, which tells him how to cut his uh, tobacco consumption. That is uh, quite a nuisance for many people. And um, that means that whole procedure costs in Swiss currency 375 francs. That's about the same in euro and a bit more in dollars. Four appointments, nine steps, plus the costs for the family doctor which has to be paid by the health insurance. I call that program, the BFP, the a big fuss program. And if in, I'm in a vicious mood, I even call it, I even call it um, uh, the pompous big fuss program. How do we do it? We, you'll see at the site, um, we, um, uh, uh, the participant, the potential, the potential participant learns of our program. He calls the office of the program. He gets the appointment and the information he's being questioned. And he comes then to the radiologist. The radiologist uh, types in his finding in this wonderful uh, form provided by ILCAP. We translate that uh, that program these findings and uh, send the participant a medical report which can be understood without any medical knowledge that costs 239 swiss francs normally um, a medical performance to this extent costs about 450 francs we offer it for 239 francs it's just one appointment four step and that is all I call that program the, um, ah, oh, ab about the costs. Uh, there's another, there's a different, there's a different currency. It costs four CWs, the CW that is a cigarette week. We promote the price saying that you have to pay what you have to pay for four weeks cigarette smoking. That is, um, that is, um, that is an idea which is very much liked by the participants. I call this um, program the Easy Access Program. And if I'm in a good mood, I call it the Easy Access Program for grown up adults. This year is the first year in which we expect a four digit number of scans. The conclusion I can make is do not wait for politicians, especially not in the EC. If you think something has to be done, do it. If uh, Claudia Henschke had uh, waited for some politicians, she would still wait nowadays. That is uh, not the good idea, I think. Do not waste time with uh, health insurances. Do it the non-profit way, do it the private system way. Try it at least. 
That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Herder. We'll now hear from Germany, um, Professor Schmidt. Thank you for the invitation now to the big neighbor in the north of Switzerland. Okay, so the first is about um, lung cancer in Germany. Yeah, Germany is uh, not doing very well with regards to lung cancer. Yeah, we have 40,000 lung cancer related deaths. The incidence is increasing, especially in women. Yeah, the um, rate of early diagnosis is rather low compared to, for example, the US recently. Five years survival is rather low. And Germany and the list of European countries, the tobacco control report, Germany ranks 36 of 36. So it's the worst country in terms of tobacco control in Europe officially. Yeah? So there is a very big need to act. And um, there have been research or ongoing research activities here. Two larger studies were LUCY on the, on the left-hand side, a randomized clinical trial. Uh, running started around 15 years ago, where we saw um, as a result, you see here the, the, the curves on men and women, and, and an interesting finding on Lucy was the uh, enormously stronger effect of lung screening in women. So women benefit much more. This was also seen in the Nelson data, uh, and then I think also retrospectively in the NLST data, but Lucy really had, had this extremely strong uh, the other activities, activity more recent is the Hanse study running in northern Germany with a mobile CT system in three cities, uh, which is ongoing. The first round is uh, completed, and I think we will see some results from Jens Vogelklausen uh, later this year. I personally hope to see something at the World Conference of Lung Cancer, which will give a further boost, yeah, because some positive results from a pilot is always helpful to promote the political decisions so far around the research. Um, what also happened in Germany is that the technical requirements for lung cancer screening are already defined. Yeah, the federal, federal Administration for Radiation Protection um, published a list of technical requirements for radiation protection, which is, I think, a the, the most uh, sophisticated uh, list and technical requirements so far. And I think it's a a good approach to directly um, make concrete, concrete statements and requirements how to do a lung cancer screening trial, which technologies to use with options to use um, to control dose and image quality. If you only set a, a threshold for the dose, yeah, people just tune down the CT systems, get a very low image quality, and then you have achieved nothing. So you need to have it a bit more sophisticated instead of just saying you need to stay below a certain level of milligrays. And how will, how does establishment in the public healthcare system in Germany work? In Germany, around 90% of the population is in the public healthcare system, though any initiatives not being part of the public healthcare system always only reach limited participation. So this is very central. Um, Germans have the reputation to do a bit of over-engineering, yeah, especially when it comes to processes. So we have two independent decision-making process. One is on the radiation protection side, which is controlled by the Federal Ministry for Environment and Consumer Protection, which rules radiation protection. They did an evaluation. It was positive. Yeah, the other is uh, reimbursement and implementation decisions under the control of the Ministry of Health, um, which uh, also did an evaluation, which was also positive, but of course, uh, having two different ministries involved doesn't speed up plans. Yeah, so the evaluations are done. They are positive. There is no real decision point anymore. Yeah, now it's more around the implementation. And the next step will be that the radiation protection ministry issues a statutory order. So a verordnung that allows then lung screening from a radiation protection perspective. Yeah, and uh, afterwards, the reimbursement decision will be made by the uh, Joint Federal Commission under the rule of the Ministry of Health to implement it in the public health insurance. Yeah, so this is an time consuming. Could it be more faster? Of course, it should be faster, but it's at least running. And um, everyone expects that 
it will come to a positive results and then we will have a national screening program within the public health insurance like we have for cervix cancer mammography colon cancer and other cancers in germany so this is basically the slide with the summary yeah so it's relatively clear that the screening program will come because the scientific medical evaluation have been done they are positive um, the question is when and how the design yeah the start that i would now expect is probably beginning of 25 for a national program and uh, with the ongoing studies uh, or and activities some open points needs clarification here yeah, for example the preliminary proposals from my point of view do not um, include the primary physicians as needed yeah this was as, as i said in the presentation before and as we learned from the us a very critical and decisive point yeah and i think there we need some improvement um, yes but looking forward to having the program started thank you thank you dr schmidt we will next hear from spain and latin america so professor say please Thank you and good afternoon. I could have my slides, please. Great, so uh, these are my disclosures and this is the summary of the talk. I'll start by saying that in Spain, lung cancer screening is discouraged at this time because of a national strategy on cancer, which was adopted uh, very recently or updated as it were, uh, albeit we're waiting for a new report from a, a technology evaluation office in Spain that will determine whether the government is willing to proceed with lung cancer screening. This despite the fact that we've been in ILCAP for close to 20 years now and that uh, uh, approximately 15,000 patients have been screened in ILCAP in Spain in all this time with great results. We have established in Spain, at least uh, the Spanish Thoracic Society, the year of lung cancer early detection. We uh, avoided the word screening because of public health authorities that might feel uh, this is not the right terminology, but we're dedicating this year with some resources from our Spanish Thoracic Society and, and a big effort to, uh, to establish the year of lung cancer early detection with a number of goals that you can see there. And this is a, an effort that I'm coordinating uh, this is the committee that is involved in this, and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Henschke for participating in this. One of the big goals is obviously our pilot, uh, national pilot that will start soon, and I will mention briefly. And also, uh, one of the projects is the uh, ESCAPE study, which will uh, be dedicated to stigma in lung cancer, smoking, and, and all of that that goes into why lung cancer screening is yet to be implemented in Europe. Our national pilot is Cassandra. It's an acronym that stands for Cancer Screening, Smoking, Cessation, and Respiratory Assessment. Uh, obviously, this is an uh, uh, initiative that is geared towards patient-centered screening. Our goal has been for some time uh, through uh, Dr. Thulueta's work and Dr. De Torres' work and, and the people we've trained uh, to look into uh, other issues that come up with screening, in particular uh, emphysema, COPD, interstitial lung disease, the other respiratory diseases that are involved in, in tobacco-related lung cancer and, and its uh, um, associated pathologies. And so we're very interested in not only uh, performing lung cancer screening, but also looking into other things such as emphysema, COPD, interstitial lung disease, heart disease, et cetera. And Cassandra is based on these three pillars. Smoking cessation is a key element of our national pilot, uh, obviously detecting uh, altered lung function is also an issue because we know and we understand that uh, altered lung function is associated with a high risk of uh, lung cancer in patients at risk. And also we're going to implement uh, a, a, uh, by a bank of images to uh, study our, our results uh, in approximately 40 plus hospitals all over Spain. These are all public hospitals that are involved in, and this is the historic consensus that uh, Cassandra brings to the fore. These are all the societies, medical societies and patient associations that are involved in uh, Cassandra, including all the regional respiratory societies, oncology, uh, radiation oncology, radiology, um, etc. And that's our, our website and all the uh, autonomous regions in Spain that are involved. There's really just one region that is not involved in this project. They are doing their own thing, and it's the region that I was born in, so it's a particular slap in the face to me uh, that I try not to take personally. 
but Galicia is not involved. We're also participating in SOLAS, which is the European uh, funded consortium that has already been mentioned by Dr. Pastorino. This was our kickoff meeting in April of this year. It was very successful and we're moving forward uh, in that uh, consortium with implementing lung cancer screening in the EU and also creating a knowledge hub that's gonna be crucial in Europe to uh, move forward with all these initiatives in terms of guidelines and documents to, uh, to uh, implement lung cancer screening in the EU. Finally, we had our first Ibero-American uh, summit in Spain, uh, coinciding with the Spanish Thoracic Society meeting in Granada in June of this year. And this is a workshop with all the representatives of the Latin American societies that participated in a small session. We had a larger session dedicated to the state of the art in lung cancer screening and what's going on. Uh, these are all the countries in red represented by uh, participants in the summit. And it's uh, interesting that uh, we had a lot of perspectives on what's going on in uh, the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal and Spain, as well as Latin America. There's some initiatives in Mexico, as you can see. Uh, screening does not exist in uh, Central America, except in Costa Rica. For example, there's only five thoracic surgeons in all of Guatemala. So that's a major problem for lung cancer screening there. Uh, as I mentioned, is, there's a number of initiatives. Uh, we've been participating in ILCAP for some time. We have Oncosur starting their project and Cassandra as well. And Inspira is the uh, uh, initiative in Galicia in the Northwest. And Portugal is overcoming challenges they haven't started yet. Uh, we have Colombia involved in ClickUp and IASLC with uh, Dr. Viola participating in the IASLC uh, Commission on, on Lung Cancer Screening. Interestingly, they mentioned that 24% of their patients with lung cancer are young non-smokers. Uh, in Venezuela, for example, there's a major challenge because 90% of their CT scans do not work anymore uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, in Chile, uh, health authorities and access are a major problem. And this is also true of Brazil, where 20% of the population are haves and 80% are have nots who are not uh, in a position to access lung cancer screening. This is the issue in Brazil as well. Uh, and finally, in Argentina, there's a consensus statement that's come out uh, and they are staging a registry called LUCAS, which will involve all the centers that are participating in screening initiatives. And finally, we uh, have uh, sent a proposal to the AECC in Spain for a 10 million grant uh, 10 million euro grant for lung cancer screening. It's the IRIS project that is uh, linked to the Cassandra initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've heard from many um, countries in Europe and now we'll be hearing a screening update from Europe um, from Professor Utkirk. Thank you. Yeah, the, the Nelson team proceeded with a new study that is EU funded. It's an implementation study in six uh, European countries funded by the EU. And we started immediately after the corona crisis. So that is quite recently. And in the meantime, we uh, tried to implement the complete Nelson methodology to a higher level and uh, bring it into this consortium. Furthermore, we combine it also with our um, uh, yeah, a large uh, study that we did in the Netherlands, that is Robinska, which is a coronary calci uh, calcification study, which is looking for mortality impact on coronary calcium uh, scoring compared to other risk scores and methodologies, and also the normal uh, way that the general practitioner will, uh, will more or less stratify uh, patients that are coming with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, cardiac complaints. Further, furthermore, and that is part of research, we are all on, also focusing on early detection of emphysema. So we, we developed one protocol, which has a uh, 0.4 millisievert uh, uh, radiation exposure rate uh, for the three tests. And that can be done. We also published this in, um, uh, with a very reliable calcium score without ECG triggering, which we, by the way, developed together with the, with, uh, the head of uh, Siemens development. And um, furthermore, all the centers use the same standardization protocols. So they also use the same CT systems, a dual source force system of Siemens. And we use also a complete integrated end-to-end -end solution management system in which we implement also AI. So we do first and first read by the radiologist together with uh, AI, which is also now the plan for Germany. 
And then if there is, are the discrepancies, and the discrepancies are only in 25% of cases, then we do a third reading by an expert panel. And we think in the future that we can come to a workload reduction up to 90% probably from all cases. But first we want to prove that it works and that we can do that indeed. So I will uh, more or less focus on that tomorrow. Then the, um, so we had a review of the EU committee after the coronary crisis, they went uh, through all the funded, clinical funded uh, projects, of course, because all the research projects had to stop more or less and to evaluate if they started again. So uh, uh, we had an overwhelming recruitment uh, in the Netherlands and also for other countries. So we have an, a national population registry uh, by which we use for the invitations and that works uh, really very well. If you we compare that to other countries that is mixed, so optional and partly uh, uh, tailored recruitment approaches in Germany and through in Italy, through pharmacies and advertising, in Spain through a GP and opportunistic, and in France uh, it's optional and partly done by uh, the Gustave Roussy, that is the center in France. Now one center is uh, not part of the EU anymore, that is in the UK of course, and they are also focusing on the package work package on recruitment. Now, those are the numbers. So up till now, we try to answer this question. If we can reliable stretch the interval, if you have a negative CT scan at baseline, and we randomize at baseline, the groups to two different groups that uh, are followed in one year and two years. So for randomization, now we have already in the system more than 10,000 people. And uh, yeah, uh, in a very short period, we could raise already. So we expect uh, in terms of CT scans, we are now over the 3000, that it will be six in uh, by September. Now, I think also a nice thing here is that from our approach and the way we invite people, and that is also something I think for this uh, meeting, we could, uh, uh, reach really the hard to reach people. As you can see here, 37% were of the lower social classes uh, and with yeah, the hard to reach category. And 40% of those are in this study. So that is very nice. And from everyone invited, 40 to 50% were eligible. So I think that's also quite an interesting way. We did uh, open in the, so you could know, use a digital system for application. But on the other hand, we had to from, we have a special law in the Netherlands for, for, for any screening. And for this, we had to also do paper invitement. So everyone got a real letter at home as an invitation. And uh, here you see the adherence. Uh, so far um, uh, to, uh, to further also uh, yeah, join the blood retrieval that we want to uh, uh, want to uh, combine with the study was up to 95%. So those are very nice figures. And this is uh, for us a very important letter. So we had a very stringent review and recently we uh, got a full acceptance of everything we reached after Corona. So that is the status at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Udkirk. We are now going to uh, move to Canada, Professor Lamb. So uh, can I have my slides, please? While waiting for the slides, I would like to thank Claudia Hanschke, David McCallivis, and uh, Mauricio Imponte for your invitation to this conference. So I'm just going to give a very brief overview about lung screening in Canada. So Canada has a large surface area but a small population. So we are the size of 90% of the United States, but only two weeks ago, we reached the 40 billion population mark. So a survey done a couple of years ago showed that 9.5 million people between the age of 55 to 74 have ever smoked. So this includes 10% of people who are still smoking, 32% have smoked previously. So we have about 4 million ever smokers. 
uh, who may benefit from screening. So just want to point out the important observation. Uh, the majority of people who have ever smoked are now former smokers. So lung screening is one of the best options for them to reduce the chance of them dying from lung cancer. So in Canada, healthcare delivery is done at the provincial and territorial level. So we have 10 provinces and two territories. So uh, British Columbia and Ontario has full provincial uh, screening program. Uh, Quebec and Alberta uh, has a pilot implementation study. There are three other provinces uh, just waiting for the government to uh, give the go ahead. Uh, it was delayed because of the COVID pandemic. So just give you the, the, the problem of uh, implementing screening in Canada. So in British Columbia, which is the third largest province in Canada, uh, we have a service area about more than three times of Italy. We have 1.3 million people between the age of 55 to 74 who have ever smoked, who are potentially eligible for screening. So in order to uh, address the access program, uh, problem, so we look at how we position the screening sites. So in order to cover uh, potentially eligible people throughout the, the whole province, we have 36 screening sites. So uh, we have done geospatial mapping to show that um, in one of these screening sites, we can access uh, one of the screening sites by potential candidates uh, within one hour of driving. And the way we do that is to use lung cancer as a proxy for potential eligible candidates because screening criteria can change uh, over time, but lung cancer patients as to which health unit they come from, they do not change that we have accurate data on where lung cancer cases are coming from. And we can address uh, uh, disparity uh, access issues more accurately that way. So in order to look at the uh, monitoring of the program to do quality control and quality improvement and evaluate the program, we have a custom-made um, information system that we share with all the cancer screening program in British Columbia. So we have all the information of all the participants from the time they enter into the program to the time the CT is done and the report is generated, which we have uh, a report in real time. Uh, we also uh, find out wh whether they have any diagnostic or, or surgical or other treatment uh, as we follow them. So the registry automatically pull data every three months to look at what has been done uh, to the participant. Uh, we also store a copy of all the low dose CT in a repository to allow us to do research study in the future. And all our scans are read by uh, CAD uh, to, to improve the consistency of reading uh, and also for monitoring to how people report uh, the CT findings. So nationally, we're the Pan-Canadian Lung Cancer Screening Network under the auspices of the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, which provides funding for implementation, support. Uh, we have a national uh, quality indicator a committee to determine what indicator can be collected and evaluated across Canada. Uh, we have a special uh, initiative on how to engage Indigenous people uh, and facilitate collaboration and logic exchange across the provinces and territories. We also have a smoking cessation network uh, under the, the CPAC uh, to allow us to integrate smoking cessation uh, into the cancer center and also in the screening program. So this is a screening uh, guideline across Canada. The age limit is, which, uh, is generally 55 to 74, although two provinces lower the age, uh, lower late age limit to 50. Um, we, all of us use the PLCO risk prediction model uh, for eligibility assessment. Uh, some use uh, the race model, while others uh, use the no race model. So the reason why we use the race model is to address uh, the disparity issue uh, in Black Canadian and also in Indigenous people. The threshold for enrollment into a screening program varies from over 1.5% to 2% or higher. So it all depends on how, how much facility we think we have to provide the screening services. In terms of the screening interval, 
uh, majority uh, do annual repeat screening for people who do not have cancer. Uh, only top two provinces, British Columbia and Manitoba, uh, we, do, we do have a biannual screening option for people who have very low uh, screening, uh, lung cancer screening, uh, lung cancer risk. So our current work is to try to facilitate implementation of screening in all the remaining provinces across Canada uh, to achieve a goal of lung cancer screening uh, in the whole of Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lam. Now we'll move to the Middle East, Professor Shoham. Okay, so I'm the first part actually. I'm going to describe uh, Israel and following me will be Egypt. So uh, what I'm going to describe today is our implementation of a national lung cancer screening pilot, which is called the TIGAR project. Okay. Okay, so lung cancer is the most common fatal malignancy in Israel. And according to the most recent data, we have a yearly incidence of over 27,000 with a, almost 19,000 deaths. Uh, so the fatality rate is uh, almost uh, 70%. And according to other countries, the, the incidence and therefore also the mortality of lung cancer is much lower. You can see here, uh, various countries in Israel, both the, the Jewish and the Arab population is in the, the far uh, left. And this was one of the obstacles to implementing lung cancer screening in Israel. Okay. So uh, the, the pilot project, it's called because it's in Hebrew acronym, but it's an, a, an application program for early detection of lung cancer using low-dose CT. It's had, it's, uh, it is organized and uh, headed by the Israeli Minister, Ministry of Health, uh, funding by the State of Israel, as I will show you. And the director of the program is an epidemiologist nurse, Leora Walensky. Uh, so just to explain, I briefly explained it actually in the meeting that was in, uh, in Switzerland uh, several years ago, but in Israel, every resident is entitled to health services under the national health insurance law. And these services are updated yearly uh, uh, by a health basket committee. And uh, the services are provided by uh, four health funds. So we have applied to the health basket several times for including uh, lung cancer sc screening. And in 2019, it was decided to uh, fund a, a pilot project. So altogether in this pilot, there are going to be 10,000 individuals age 50 to 79 with 20, 20 years back of smoking. And uh, each one of them is uh, going to undergo a baseline as well is a, an annual uh, screening and the resources were allocated both for the studies and for human resources that are needed to run the project. So the outcomes that we are going to measure are response rate by age, sector and geographic region, rate of positive findings, the stage at diagnosis as well as potential harms. And the, the, as a result of this project, we are also going to submit recommendations for suit, suitable infrastructure. So uh, when we have the results, we are going to apply again to the Health Basket to, Committee to, to fund the full uh, national program. So this is the stru structure of the pilot. Uh, under the TIGAR management, there is a steering committee as well as four working groups. Uh, we worked uh, with the Israeli Center for Disease Control, and in each of the health funds, uh, the uh, pilot clinics were uh, selected to reflect uh, various uh, parts of uh, the society. Uh, this is the process. So the the upper line is uh, will be is is being done in the pilot clinics, and once. Um, uh, the this, this screening is approved, approved and agreed to have a lung cancer screening. Uh, they are going to get referred from their um, family physician and uh, an LD, LDCT appointment is being done. And when we issue the report, if it is negative, the participant will go back to uh, annual screening. 
And if it is uh, positive or indeterminate, they will uh, see a pulmonologist. We may change this because they probably they, they have too many participants have to see a pulmonologist and also a smoking cessation uh, is, um, re is recommended to the participants. So we did uh, a training for radiologists in uh, January uh, uh, of uh, 2022. It was online, it was uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, it was recorded and it is available online. Uh, 65 uh, radiologists from all over the country participated. And also lectures on coronary artery calcification, which were recorded by Joe Shemesh, who is familiar to many of us, uh, are also available. And uh, it is available in the ISRA, the Israeli Radiological Association website, as well as on the Ministry of Health uh, TIGAR website. So a lot, so there is a lot of um, information which has been uh, prepared by the Ministry of Health. So this is a patient brochure in Hebrew, as well as in Arabic. Uh, there are posters that, that could be hung in the pilot clinics, also in Hebrew and in Arabic. There are infographics in uh, Hebrew, Arabic, and Russian. And there are also, this is a recorded lecture explaining about the pilot by a pulmonologist and recorded simulations. So all of this is available on the Ministry of Health uh, website. Uh, we are planning to use AI, uh, so a compre comprehensive AI system. We haven't, uh, it's probably going to, we're going to use several AI systems in uh, various places, uh, integrated with the Screening Plus um, part uh, or a section of reporting um, and um, sorry, I think I need to go on back. So a registry was set up in the Ministry of Health to record uh, all, all of the data that we collect through these pro programs and there are coordinators uh, in each of the health funds. Okay, and this is actually what we have done to date. So we started uh, in January of 2023 we have screened uh, nearly 1,500, so about uh, 10 percent, and uh, you can see how the participants were recruited. Each health fund decided how they want to, they, they, they chose the pilot clinics and they decided how they would like to recruit participants. So you see that some of them have a phone call, SMS, and uh, the one that is doing the work is actually recruiting through the family physicians. So just to summarize, uh, we need to, uh, to have standardization because there are many radiologists reading the scans and uh, we are going to integrate AI, which will help us with that. Um, we have, oh. okay, I, I'm finishing, dual readings. Um, we are going to update to Lang rates 2022 and this is the end. Uh, uh, we're going to use the ILCAP teaching file for teaching. So I apologize for being late. Thank you. And now we'll move to Egypt. We'll be hearing from Prof Professor Korshed. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, I'd like to thank David and Claudia for, first of all, inspiring us and for inviting me here. I'm Mauritius. So thank you very much. So can I have my slides? And by the way, David, I'm going to be a little bit, uh, I'm not going to be on time. So I apologize for that. Because I really will say the data about Egypt. So, okay, it's working. So, yes, we have a lot of lung progress uh, in, in, in the last two decades, improvement in the survival, decrease in the incidence. And mainly that was because of early detection and diagnosing lung cancer earlier. And having uh, the, the uh, having better targets and immune checkpoint inhibitors. However, this is not reflecting in our uh, country. We are having an increase in the incidence. I'll show you the incidence now. And the problem is, the other problem is that we are having an increase in the mortality. And this is mainly that because we are diagnosing our patients with white and advanced disease, and we don't have access to the new precision drugs. So this is Egypt. Uh, we are a population of 100 million more than 100 million. And unfortunately, lung cancer has risen from being the fourth most common 
uh, six most common to the third most common. So it's really rising. There's not only in males, even in females, uh, has risen from 3.7 to 13.8 per 100,000, mainly due to smoking and secondhand smoking. And unfortunately, 80% of our patients are diagnosed in advanced disease. So, and we know that these numbers are going to triple in the coming years. And the main cause is because Egypt uh, it has a true problem with tobacco. We have a problem that we are one of the highest consumers of tobacco in the Middle East. 50% uh, of our males are smokers, unfortunately, and this is going to go up to 60%. And we in Egypt smoke 80 billion cigarettes per year. Uh, this is why we're having an increase in the incidence. And unfortunately, it's, uh, we have children now smoking and 16% of our children are smoking at a very young age. Now, the NCI is the oldest and the largest academic center, academic and research center in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, we, we see around 26,000 new pa uh, patients per year, and annually we see around 315,000 cases per year. This, is, this has been there for 60 years. This is the main building. And now we have spread in uh, east and, uh, and west of Egypt. Here we have uh, these two new hospitals. We would love to have you come and visit us when you come. So because we are seeing a lot of advanced lung cancer, we're doing really bad in that. We started the white Egyptian white ribbon project. That was in June, 2022. And uh, we, this was the first initiative in Egypt, Africa, and the Middle East. And uh, it was called, oops, am I going too fast? Uh, how do I go back? Okay. And it, it was called uh, Breath is Life. And it was named after Dr. Rabab Ghaffar. She is one of the eminent uh, oncologists who recently passed away and she dedicated her life for lung cancer. And this is actually a photo from the, uh, the, the, the project, the White Tree Project live photo from uh, the, the pyramids. It was, in, it was broadcasted from the pyramids. And so the initiative was uh, made, uh, a part of this initiative was to go through a pilot uh, phases in order to be able to uh, have a successful course. We wanted to see how successful we're going to be in that. Uh, then we needed to understand whom are we going to screen and how can we reach our very low income patients, the very poorest of the poor, and how to reach them in a message because, you know, in Egypt, uh, cancer is quite a stigma. So this is why we adopted the British way of saying lung health campaign. It's not lung, can lung cancer screening. And of course, we had a tobacco cessation program with this state of the art algorithm in lung cancer screening. We are trying to do that. Uh, to, and another thing is to, return, to, to have retention, adherence, and cost effectiveness and fund is important because we have a very limited resources. So in September 2022, we started doing the screening. It was really a community based where uh, we went to a very poor, impoverished uh, place. And, uh, and we went by ourselves to do the screening there. We had uh, clinics over there. It was coupled with awareness and tobacco uh, cessation uh, and inclusion. What we included, we screened uh, 40 years. We started screening at 40 years because as I told you, we, start, we see lung cancer in quite a younger uh, age. Okay. And uh, we had uh, access, the, the, the CT was done in the National Cancer Institute. And at that time, at this first pilot, we screened 1,500 uh, par participants. So this was what we used in node detections. And we did uh, track our patients using uh, national ID and we gave them screening numbers. So this is where we went. This was actually, a per this place was a slum. It had the poorest of the poor people who were living there. They were addicts, there were uh, chronic heavy smokers, and this place was recently renovated to what's called New Roda Sayeda, and we went from the NCI to that place, and we were able to, uh, this place contains around 800 families, we screened 1,500 of them, and we found that more than 500 were high risk. We had awareness uh, campaigns and awareness sessions, which was very important. We needed people to understand what was going on, and the eight clinics really did include oncologists, oncologists, vaccination, and we had people from the Ministry of uh, Social Solidarity who were uh, trying to do drug substancization uh, thing. And we had a very comprehensive questionnaire for trying to capture the screen. The, okay, oh dear. <laughs> so what are the strength and, and success for that campaign? Well, uh, it was quite comprehensive. It was the first pilot trial. Uh, and we were able to properly address the population. They were able to really come and, 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 pay, and participants really wanted to share. 
we started very early, so we were able to capture our patients. More important, we had excellent media coverage. And because of that excellent media coverage, which was highly publicized at that point, we now have people coming to knock the door and say, well, I'm a smoker. I don't have any symptoms. I need to do a screening. And this is one of them who we, whom we discovered that she had a nodule in her lung, as you see. Now, the most important success was this was adopted by the government. And this started a, a presidential screening campaign where lung cancer initiative was done, including live uh, lower nine governments, 100,000 were screened. Okay, so can I say one th final thing? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> now, the challenges that we have seen, and this is, you know, it's gonna be different than any uh, other place in the world, is that because uh, we, so we went to the people and the problem is they, some of them were not able to screen some of them because they didn't afford to come to do the screening. They didn't have money to come uh, to, to the National Cancer Institute. So this is something that we are looking at, uh, definitely identifying the high risk and how to reach people. And, and then how frequent should we do this? A lot of issues that we are looking at so as to make this program applicable and quite cost effective. And these were the lessons that we learned from, uh, from, from this pilot trial. Adherence and retention, this is something that we really need to work on. Uh, we need to have better risk tools. We are mobile. And now we're getting mobile CTs to do that. Government support, you've seen what we did. And definitely fundraising is important. And now we're going to be having the third screening uh, wave that's going to be done by the NCI. 10,000 families. Again, this was a slum that was completely renovated by the government. Again, people are very poor and we're happy to be uh, particip uh, participating in doing the screening for them. So what we want to do is to screen more, uh, more people, to screen them better and to truly try to save lives. And I just want to um, just acknowledge Professor Gaffer. Uh, she is a great woman who did a lot, and unfortunately, we lost her for COVID. And uh, definitely thank the medical oncology department, the radio diagnosis department, and statistical department in the NCI. And finally, this is what everyone was talking about. I would love to invite you all to come to the next uh, ILCAP meeting and the next uh, on tech Oncotherapy International Congress meeting in January. Thank you very much. Oh, God. Thank you, Dr. Korshed. Okay, let's move on to the USA. Let's bring up Dr. Kazaruni. Thanks so much for having me, Claudia, David. Amazing work over so many years, and we are so grateful to what you have started to be able to make all this possible and to save so many lives from lung cancer. Uh, in the US, um, we have uh, now almost 5 million lung cancer screens in the American College of Radiology's Lung Cancer Screening Registry, which we approximate to be about 2 million people who have been screened. It does not include people who are screened in systems like our Veterans Health Administration, which is actively rolling out lung cancer screening um, across the United States in those facilities, as well as programs like the Department of Defense or any capitated system. So we are seeing an increase in lung cancer screening. We have, um, are seeing decreases in lung cancer incidence and mortality in the U.S., which is complicated, but there's at least two data sets now that are showing a stage shift in lung cancer diagnosis, which we believe is attributable to early detection through lung cancer screening. So it's good to see that maturation of screening of time in the population. I'm going to talk about the Lung Rad 2022 update. I will shorten that component, so if I click, click, click really fast, I want to try and keep us on time. I'm going to talk a little bit about screening uptake adherence and strategies to accelerate screening. I just mentioned our Veterans Health Administration, the work that they're doing through the Lung Precision Oncology Program and partners who are here with LCAP is really tremendous to bring this to that population, which has a high burden of current and former individuals who smoked. I will talk about the last two in italics uh, tomorrow during the quality symposium, the quality panel led by Bruce Pianson. We'll talk about HEDIS measure development, which is active and underway as a policy measure to increase screening in health systems and through health plans. And I'll talk about some of the ACR's lung cancer screening uh, project templates tomorrow. So we got a big boost in lung cancer screening in the U.S. through the Cancer Moonshot Initiative reinvigoration. And the topic that they chose last year was closing the gaps in cancer screening through the President's uh, White House um, cancer panel. They tackled the most common lung cancer screening tests we have, breast, cervical, colorectal, and lung cancer and try to tackle and understand how we can improve communications and align with patients and providers.
facilitate equitable access, strengthen workforce collaborations, including community health engagement, and create effective health IT systems on which a lot of the work that we do is so fundamental. Um, Long Ranch 2022, I think the things that I'll, I'll mention, and I will skip over some of the other slides, I think one of the most important things is addressing atypical pulmonary cysts and cavitary nodules, for which there is not a wealth of data. So there was a lot of expert knowledge and discussion, and we're grateful to David Yankelevitz and team for being able to work to apply this new schema for cystic nodules to the cases in the ILCAP database to understand how it works as well as see how it works in practice. We've expanded juxtaplural nodules to include any nodules along any pleural surface based on the sum of the data that has come out of the ILCAP program. We've done some clarifications around airway nodules, growth, a new step management approach, which I will talk about, um, classifying infectious or inflammatory, and the S modifier. So this is what our cystic and cavitary classification looks like. If anybody wants a copy of these slides, I am happy to email them because I know that we're short on time and I won't, don't want to go in too much detail, but they grow through increasing size of cysts, increase in loculation of cysts, increasing septation or nodularity of cyst walls to increase the risk of cancer and their upscale the most aggressive component. For nodules that are cavitary with a dominant solid component, we still recommend they be managed by the solid component. So if I look at some examples, thin-walled cysts, these are not on the table for lung rads. These are considered negative. A nodule like this that is cavitary with some wall thickening and a little bit of nodularity on one side or asymmetric wall thickening is a category 4A lesion, which gets a follow-up CT. This one had no change in three months. And nodules, cavitary nodule like this with a little septation in the middle of it, you could call it slightly thick or slightly nodular. It's asymmetric in the cyst, got a, their follow-up low to CT, and now we can see the developing exophytic nodule within or along the cyst wall. This is upcoded to our highest category of risk and turned out to be a squamous cell carcinoma. Here is a cystic lesion where the dominant part is the solid nodule. So we still recommend management in lung ridge using the solid component size. And this turned out to be an invasive lung adenocarcinoma. Multilocular cysts are a real grouping of cysts from the one on the left, just a thin septation in the middle to the second from the left, a thick, slightly nodular septation. To the next one, multilocular cysts with a little bit of ground glass and similarly the one on the right. So it's a really complex group of cysts and we don't really understand these well. If you look at the box in yellow, there's a baseline screen and an annual seat screen which shows that this growing multilocular cyst is changing over time. This increases the likelihood of cancer and upcoding to 4B. And the example in the blue box, baseline screen, multi-cystic with a nodular septal thickening area. And at their next annual screen, you can see the increase in soft tissue. This upcoded to the highest category lesion. As I mentioned, we now include all juxtaplural nodules on any surface that are under 10 millimeters and meet the criteria of smoothly marginated along fissures or pleural borders as now negative screens, which will downcode a bunch of, of category three lesions to negative screens, um, reducing the workup of those patients. And we've also created some clarification on airway nodules, which are about half percent of all lung cancer screens. And of course, we have things that we want to call off from being positive screens that have air in them or mucoid impact bronchi. But when we see a discrete nodular filling defect like this on a baseline screen, we want to bring a patient back and see what's happened. In this case, it did not move. It is not mucus. It's adherent to the wall. This was up to a 4B and subsequently went to bronchoscopy. Example at left in the yellow box, two different baseline screens with discrete solid endobronchial nodules, category 4A lesions come back in three months. And on the blue box, baseline screen, a normal airway, annual screen, now a new endobronchial nodule of significant concern. What I do want to also mention is we've moved to a stepped management approach, and we think this is more appropriate so that the highest risk lesions are getting continued to follow more closely rather than simply returning everybody to annual screen after their first lung rads um, workup is negative. So it means a lung rads three at baseline comes back is called a lung rads two if it's unchanged and then goes out 12 months to 18 months. So stretching out the timeline following these up, whereas the highest risk lesions get imaged a little bit earlier. So that's the concept. 
What's adherence in the US? We usually hear doom and gloom because most of the data that's presented is based on 2017, 18, 19 data, which is older. This is the most recent publication from four states that participated in the BRFA survey, Maine, Michigan, my state, New Jersey, and Rhode Island, and showed that the screening prevalence increased about 8% from 2019 to 2021, so that almost 21.2% of individuals who were asked if they were screened had been screened. That's positive information. We do recognize that across the country, each state is its own local microclimate, if you will, or microculture in healthcare, that we do have states where the screening rate is well under 5%. So we do recognize heterogeneity. But we do know is that white individuals are more likely to undergo screening than their black counterparts. The patients with a primary care provider have higher screening rates than those who don't. And that individuals who formerly smoked are more likely to undergo screening than those who are currently smoking, which may be related to factors such as stigma. This questions for lung cancer screening will be in every BRFA survey starting in 2022, every two years. So we should have more national data in the future. We also looked at data from the American Cancer, the American College of Radiology's first 1.2 million screens. And sadly, only 22% of people are coming back for their next annual screen. We must do better at helping people understand that like mammography and colorectal cancer screening, it is a journey. It is not a one and done. Adherence similarly varies by factors like um, health insurance. People who are currently smoking, Hispanic, Black, or lower education are less likely to come back for annual screening, just like they're less likely to get screened at the beginning. We also know that in some parts of the country, Western and the South, there's less screening and less return to screening. We held a summit last summer to try and address barriers and strategies to address them to accelerate lung cancer screening uh, through the American Cancer Society and the National Lung Cancer Roundtable. And the top three are EHR and the, the IT systems that people use to identify people to screen and track people through their screening journey. We're holding a workshop this fall with EHR vendors at the table with experts to address what we need from the EHR to make this a better system. Other issues include patient education and primary care uh, physician education. And lastly, together, we're all here because we want to create lung cancer screening in the U.S. We're holding our second annual National Lung Cancer Screening Day, November 11th, Saturday. It's the second Saturday in November. If anybody wants to take this flavor and spread it around the world, please do. But we want to try and get radiology facilities to open on Saturday to bring in people who screen and create a hubbub in their communities among their providers and their patients to bring them in for screening. This year, it happens to fall on Veterans Day, and the Veterans Health Administration is working with us to support Lung Cancer Screening Day for their veterans around the time of uh, Veterans Day this year. So we're very grateful to the Veterans Health Administration for helping to, to accelerate this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kazaruni. I have informed we do have a video from Australia, so we weren't able to get our presenter live, but we'll be um, turning our attention to the screen for Professor McWilliams' update from Australia. Good afternoon. I will be discussing the story of implementation of lung cancer screening in Australia. And I'm talking to you today from Perth, Western Australia. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community. I also pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. These are my disclosures. We don't have a lung cancer screening program currently in Australia. Uh, screening mm -hmm. programs in Australia are, run, are federally run, and we currently have breast, colorectal, and cervical. But we've had a clinical uh, screening program in Western Australia for the last 30 years, with the asbestos review program commenced in 1990 by the late Professor Bill Musk to screen uh, asbestos-exposed patients from their wet noon mine. This changed to low dose CT more than 10 years ago, and this program is currently ongoing, led by Professor Fraser Brims. We've been part of the International Lung Screen Trial in Australia, and the initial results were published last year, and the final data um, uh, analysis is currently underway. This trial commenced in 2017 2018. 
On this background, on lung, World Lung Cancer Day in 2019, the previous Federal Health Minister, Greg Hunt, announced that he was going to ask Cancer Australia to conduct an inquiry into the feasibility of lung cancer screening in Australia. Cancer Australia is a federal agency that advises the federal government on cancer control and shows leadership in that field. It, it was formed in 2006 and the current director is Professor Dorothy Keefe, who just took over that position in mid-2019, just before this announcement. She promptly organised the first workshop in September that year in Sydney, New South Wales, and work began. This, 15 months later, this inquiry was completed and submitted to the federal government. And six months after that, in May 2021, there was a further just over $6 million of federal funding uh, provided to Cancer Australia to form a detailed program design. This program design started in July 2021, and was completed in late 2022, and comprised a number of different work streams. Cancer Australia did apply to the Medical Services Advisory Committee to ask them to support a national screening program and to provide a public uh, fee for, the bill, uh, for billing for the low-dose CT. The Medical Services Advisory Committee is an independent non-statutory committee that advises the federal government about new services that may come under public funding and in what circumstances they should be funded. The other work streams included co-design with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, workforce and infrastructure modelling and mapping, as well as uh, development of program tools, data governance and quality assurance uh, frameworks. This is an example of some of the mapping work done by Cancer Australia. Uh, SAs are statistical areas, um, represent, uh, geographical areas provided by the Australian Bureau of Statistics that shared similar regional characteristics. The towns in black are where more than 50% of um, those uh, the population resides and the towns in red are where the CT scanners are. These are the 10 largest SA3s in Australia, which are areas that, regional areas of over 300,000 square kilometres and four of them are in Western Australia. And this shows some of the challenges in accessing uh, populations who may be potential participants. If you're a potential participant in Derby, you need to travel 161 kilometres to Broome for your CT. And if you live in Jigalong or Newman, it'd be 350 kilometres to Port Hedland. So this is highlighted, so this detailed work is highlighted where we may need new fixed CT infrastructure or where we may need uh, a mobile CT scanning service. The final program design was only released to the public in May 2023 this year. But prior to that, in October 2022, the Medical and uh, Services Advisory Committee released their advice, which was to support lung cancer screening, and they provided a fee for that service for LODO CT. However, there were some differences between the uh, committee and the Cancer Australia pr proposal. The, the two most important ones are the risk assessment or the eligibility criteria for screening. Cancer Australia have proposed using a probabilistic approach using the PLCO risk score with a targeted approach to screening and the uh, advisory committee recommended categorical criteria. The starting age for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders was recommended to be younger uh, by Cancer Australia because they developed cancer at a younger age but the advisory committee decided on the same starting age and completion for all Australians. Soon after the program release, the current Federal Health Minister, the Honourable Mark Butler, announced an investment of just under $264 million for 2023 to 2024 to implement a national lung cancer screening program in Australia to commence in July 2025. So much work to be done. Thank you.